Um, hi, everyone. How are we doing? Great. Uh, are we tired? <laughs> Same. Um, I actually literally just did this talk three days ago in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we had two hours instead of 45 minutes. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is cut to the chase, and I'm going to give you a lot of nitty-gritty stuff that I think y'all might want. Um, again, my name is Daniel. Uh, if you use Twitter or Instagram, that's where I am. Um, I work on the arts team at Kickstarter. There's only three of us on that team. Um, and Kickstarter, of course, is a site that is launching crowdfunding projects. Um, who has been on Kickstarter? Who has backed something on Kickstarter? Pledged to a project. There we go. Who's made a project? Ah, great. Um, so, now that most of you know what Kickstarter is, I'll kind of breeze through a little bit as to not only what Kickstarter is, but I also like to ask who is Kickstarter. Um, we'll kind of breeze through a little bit of Kickstarter in the world. Those are projects that I've worked on. Again, I work in the art and photography categories. There's 15 categories on the site. There's games, there's film, there's music, you name it. But I'm really working in those two verticals. Um, seeing projects not only launch on the site, but also do talks and workshops like this where I want to also hear what you're working on um, and see if it, makes, if it makes sense for Kickstarter. Um, what I do want to spend a lot of time on is tips and tricks and then we will get to the questions. Sound good? Okay, great. So who is Kickstarter? This is actually our mission, uh, which is Kickstarter helps bring creative projects to life. Um, we like to, as broadly as possible, define creative and define projects, primarily because we're a global community built around creativity and creative projects. And we really like the idea of connecting makers, artists, and creators of all kinds to the support and resources they need to make their ideas a reality. And oftentimes with Kickstarter, right, it's a crowdfunding project, so you're either doing an exhibition, it might be a mural, it might be a photo book, you name it, and you're setting a goal and you have to reach that goal amount. That might be 5,000, that might be $500, that might be 30,000. Of course, the main goal is to get funds for your project and reach that amount, but there are additional goals and I oftentimes say it's often smart to think about how the Kickstarter can do multiple things at the same time. That might mean you set a goal yourself to say, I want this project to be 20% people who don't know me. The backers who are coming in, I want at least 20% of people who might not know me, and this is their introduction into my work. You could also have a goal that might mean, I want an exhibition to come out of this. So you use the Kickstarter and the success of the Kickstarter as an excuse to go talk to curators. Maybe it's time to talk to exhibition managers. These are all great ways to essentially fold in and do multiple things at the same time. Um, we're also a PBC. Does anyone know what a PBC is? Okay, yeah. I didn't know what it was either before when I, when I started at Kickstarter. We actually legally reincorporated as a PBC as opposed to an LLC. And what that does is it, uh, it, we're obliged to consider the impact of our decisions on society and not just shareholders. So our mission, we hold it technically above the interest of uh, shareholders, which is in an ideal world, the reason why I exist as a job, most of my projects I'm working on are raising anywhere from $1,000 to $10,000. Kickstarter only makes 5% uh, of, of, we take 5% off successful projects. So if we weren't a PBC, we might be a company that is just simply doing some projects that are raising millions of dollars but we really wanted to ensure that, the, that artists, filmmakers, designers that, are, that need to fund less than you know, $20 million have a home here. And that's something that I kind of really appreciate. This is something that's taken from uh, our benefit statement. We release one that goes through all of our stats, our employees, uh, what our makeup of employees are. Um, and this is something that I really kind of uh, 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 take to heart here which is that art, of course, challenges us in authority. Um, it gives us beauty, humor, and joy, but it's also under threat. And their value is intangible and not easily quantified, which is the reason why we need uh, them to reside in our gut and not just necessarily our numbers. So Kickstarter in the world, the big numbers. Uh, there's been about 176,000 projects funded on Kickstarter. In total, that's been 4.7 billion, and in the arts alone, that has been $233 million. 
Here's one that maybe some of you saw two years ago. Uh, this is with a uh, art organization in New York called Public Art Fund. They did a project with Talba Auerbach to repaint, repaint and offer free rides to citizens of New York. Uh, a pretty legendary fireboat called the John J. Harvey. It was slated for a uh, decommission, and it's also the old, but it's the oldest fireboat. It was built in 1914. So this thing has been going on for 100 years and so. Um, it was also known to be actually shipping people who were evacuating during 9-11. It was the oldest ship that was doing that. So this was the history and a story that public art funded Talba Auerbach wanted to essentially bring to Kickstarter and say, we care about this history, we care about this story, and with your help we can actually offer free rides and paint it and ensure that that legacy continues. And you'll see sometimes the, the numbers in the backer count here, I also want to draw your attention that they're all over the place. Um, which is why I like Kickstarter. Again, it goes back to the idea that the dollar amount or the number of backers matters less than the story you're telling. And if you're telling a really compelling story, someone is gonna wanna support it whether they know you or not. So here's another project. This is one that I, actually the first one I ever worked on, which was with an artist, Pope L, who wanted to raise funds for the Flint water crisis. What he did was uh, raise about $17,000 and give it to Flint residents. Uh, turn on their tap water, which still contains E. coli and lead, uh, and bottle it as an artwork, <laughs> sell that artwork, and then all of the proceeds from that artwork went back into a crisis relief fund. So in many ways, this was a, a kind of legendary Kickstarter project where it, 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 it raised funds and then doubled its impact, and then in, in, in all it raised about $30,000 and gave that directly to a community in need. This is a type of project that I really like showing if you care about a community, if you care about social justice, this is a great way to do it, which is essentially raise funds for an exhibition to talk about something, and then while you're, uh, uh, if those works are for sale, have that go back into the community. This is a project that, uh, Amplifier, which is a nonprofit based in Seattle, ran uh, the pretty iconic Shepherd Fairy, Ernesto Yoruba, and Jessica Sabogo prints that they handed out during the, uh, the first Women's March in 2018, the day after Trump's election. Uh, they only ran this for 10 days, and this is the one that went out of control. It's the only project that has raised uh, on, on our team $1.3 million, but uh, we're actually gonna be doing something similar to this in the summer, uh, where we're inviting artists to make protest posters and zines and pass them out in the communities that they care about in advance of the election. Um, this is something that I always say, tapping into of the idea of Kickstarter is, again, telling a story and making something that says, I care about this and I want you to have that and I want you to be part of it, because that's the way you get beyond the, oh, here's $5, have fun with your project, but it's, here's 50, and can I help? Can I distribute things with you? Can I paint with you? That's where you start unlocking the idea of a successful Kickstarter project, where again, it's going beyond just the dollar amount. It's helping you raise audience, it's helping you pre-build something, and it potentially could bring in collaborators. Here's the last, uh, the last two is one is, this is a monument and memorial that Ebony G. Patterson created to honor the history of one of the first uh, pools that was desegregated in America. So she raised funds to give it a paint job, install uh, uh, four benches, and then give the rest of the funds to the Public Parks Association in Kansas City so that they could maintain the site if they choose to. And the last one is Four Freedoms. They had the ridiculous idea of running 52 campaigns at the same time. <laughs> um, and that was uh, to raise funds and buy billboard advertisement space during the 2018 election in every single state and Puerto Rico and Washington, DC. And the idea behind it was to literally give artists public space to talk about an issue that they cared about in advance and during the election. Again, a lot of these examples that I love are telling a story and inviting someone into the project. Any questions on those before we get nitty gritty? Okay, great. So, what's a Kickstarter project anyway? The kind of loose idea is that you're creating something to share with others. The share I've bolded because that's really, really important. It honestly is oftentimes hard if you are an artist to raise funds to go to a residency on Kickstarter because it's, that's a time for you to work on yourself. That's a time for you to build your practice. And sometimes art 
work comes out of it, and sometimes it doesn't. Instead, thinking about a project that might be an exhibition, a memorial, a monument, a mural, a photo book, a print series, those are ways in which the person who is supporting you is getting invited into the process. Of course, if it's a residency where it's, if you give 50 bucks, you get to be part of the residency, sounds good. But again, it's thinking about the idea of sharing something with others. Um, your project is also very honest and very clearly presented. So if you're planning an exhibition, it could be as simple as, what's the timeline? When Do you have a date as to when you want to show? Um, what's a loose idea of your budget? It does not have to be every cent. But essentially showing your audience and showing the people that love you or, or people who don't that you know what you're doing. Honestly, it goes a long, 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 long way. Um, what your project isn't is technically simply fundraising for a cause. So that would be if the Pope L project just raised, fun, raised funds and then just gave it to a family, right? That essentially is GoFundMe. It's also Indiegogo. You can do that. Kickstarter says that, honestly, those projects need to exist. But it can be very hard if you're fundraising for an album and then, say, fundraising for a family member who is suffering. That is a really jarring experience. And those two should exist on separate sites. So our site is simply for creative projects that you're sharing with others. Um, they can be politically oriented, they can be social justice focused, but the gist behind it has to be some sort of output, an exhibition, a print series, a conversation. Those are the things that we want to see funded on our site because then it shows that there's, a, there's actual conversation happening. Um, you can also not necessarily technically offer financial incentives. So if you're starting a business, you can't say for 50 bucks you get equity or you get shareholder interest because that gets legally way too complicated. Um, and you can't also make prohibited items. So that would be, you know, for 20 bucks, I'm going to give you a joint. For 20 bucks, I'm going to give you a beer because we can't verify if someone is over the age of 21. Pretty simple stuff, right? Mostly common, common knowledge, common sense. Um, I want to spend a little time on thinking about all or nothing, too. So the, the kind of question that always gets brought up is, what happens if I'm trying to raise $5,000 and I only made $500? The problem with Kickstarter or, uh, uh, and the problem with creative projects is that if, you've got, if you know your budget is $5,000 and you had 500 people gave, give you a dollar, how are you going to make that project with 500 bucks? That puts you in actually a really risky position because what you said you were going to make is probably going to be not the scale that you promised. And you might probably be dissatisfied. Your 500 people who gave a dollar come to the exhibition and only see one artwork instead of 20. It puts you in a really tight position. And that's why we say for, for the site, when you set your goal, you have to make it. You have to reach that goal in the duration of time that you've set. Because we know and we understand with artists that there is a budget. And if you want to do it honestly, and if you want to make sure you pay yourself too, that should be part of the budget. So again, it works. It's less risk. It's also honestly a little bit more compelling. Um, it sometimes is good to have a little fire under your butt to know that you need to make that $500 more um, so that you can pay your collaborator if they're printing uh, prints for you, for example. So it's a way to keep it, again, honest, compelling, and urgent. Sometimes you need that kind of uh, fire under your butt to, to really send that one more email, you know, or send that one more newsletter. So things to note, some kind of general stats that, that we like to kind of contextualize, only about 36% of projects reach their funding goal. So that means the majority of projects are actually not reaching their funding goal. In the arts, it's a little bit higher, actually. It's about 45 so just under half are reaching their goal. And that is primarily because we're working really hard to make sure that people don't set too ambitious of a goal. That is the actual number one reason why people don't fund on Kickstarter is their goal is way too high. Um, some two other stats that then give you a little bit more confidence is that if you just hit 20% of your goal, you're 80% likely to actually fund. Or conversely, if you just reach 25 backers, you're 75% likely to fund. So in many ways, that's the idea of the snowball effect or the bandwagon effect, which is something I love to tell artists. If, you've, if you're planning to launch on a certain day, launch the day before and then have five or 10 of your friends support the project. 
or maybe your, your, your roommate, it might be your friend's dog's walker's cousin that loves your work and always wanted to print. If you launch a little bit early and you give that momentum already and then you make a large announcement, that actually shows people that like, oh, that reward is actually selling out really fast. Whoa, there's actually a ton of interest in it. I wanna pledge too. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, and the most successful goal size for campaigns is actually 10,000 and under. So a lot of those projects we saw ended up raising more than that. Actually, most projects, if they're successful, they raise about 120% of their goal. Um, we're still just taking 5%. So you could quadruple your goal if you set it at 10,000, you make 40, great. We're still just taking 5%. Um, but the idea behind it is, is if you set a goal relatively low and you double it, triple it, you have the optics of saying there was twice as much interest in this. Or we set a goal and there was 300% interest. We were triple as funded as we thought, which then sets you up actually long-term if you want to do another project. Or again, if this is an exhibition, you bring it to people and say, we, we fundraised on Kickstarter and we were twice as funded. There was twice the amount of interest as, as we anticipated. It's kind of a, a, a thing that I really love offering. So in summary, it's good to kind of ask yourself these three questions before you dive into the Kickstarter. What are your goals? That's how I started, right? Thinking about more than just making money, but maybe you want to get a collaborator. Maybe you want this to be an opportunity to speak to a curator. Maybe you set yourself a goal where you want to have 30% of the, the people come in on that campaign be brand new to your audience, right? On average, actually about 10 to 30% of the people who come in, you will not know who they are. And that's kind of the reason why you would launch a Kickstarter too, is, is because it's a natural way to invite new people into your project. And that might be because it's on the arts page, it might be because we put it in a newsletter, it might just be because there, there's a funder on Kickstarter, and I see this pretty frequently. People are on that site giving a dollar, five, ten, because they love you and they love the story. And this is the way to introduce yourself to them. Um, the uh, second part is what, uh, who are the people most excited about your work? Usually they're closer than you think. It might be a best friend, it might be someone who purchased your work previously, and then they might do the work of introducing you to someone else who may wanna buy that $500 print. Um, the third piece is uh, what's the best story in your project? And this is actually coming back to you of the idea of how many ways can we think about community? How many ways can we think about a residency? There's so many, and there's so many stories you can tell with a project. But some of them uh, might position yourself to, to speak larger and speak more broadly about a project that say if it's social justice oriented and you're doing a project about environmentalism, then your story is, is I'm an artist working in the, the climate crisis and with your help we can have this exhibition about it. Right, so thinking about what is the selling point, thinking about what is the way to get someone excited, and what's the way for you to uh, also feel comfortable sharing it out, right? So, how are we on time? You have 10 minutes. Yes! <laughs> so, I love this. Um, there's four main things you should think about for a campaign. This is after you've figured out, this is the project I wanna do, this makes sense, uh, this is the story I want to tell. These are just the nuts and bolts of how to actually get in on the site, right? So it's text. So that is, in an ideal world, not written like a grant op application, but written like yourself, written like it's, you're, you're convincing a friend to join you. There's also the video, if you want to do one. It's a very, very short one or two minute introduction as to, hi, I am a real human, and I am an artist, and I'm doing this project, and I want you to be part of it. Um, that comes back to showing that, again, you're a real human and that someone can trust you. Um, the third piece is the rewards. So those are all the different levels people come in. It could be 10, 50, 100, 1,000. Um, and then there's outreach. So planning and figuring out, how am I gonna circulate this? Do I have friends in press? Do I have a newsletter? Uh, are my friends active on social media? How do I find my audience and how do I tell them about the project? So for the text, um, the two, two big notes are be direct and have a call to action. Um, being direct is very hard. As an artist myself, I can never be direct with my own work. <laughs> so it might be good if you're uncomfortable writing about your own work, ask a friend to summarize what that work is because they will probably be a little bit more direct than you are if you're 
worried about it, right? So the, the Pope L project is a great example. Um, all of those examples still exist on Kickstarter. All projects lie on Kickstarter as, as a way for you to do research and understand what works and what doesn't. Um, that one, the first paragraph was, we're doing a project that is celebrating, or that is, that is uh, uh, raising awareness of the ongoing Flint water crisis and your help, we can make an exhibition about it and raise funds to give back to the community. Done. That's two sentences, right? Um, there's also the call to action, what I just said. With your help or with your support, we can make this together. Getting away from the idea of please help me or being in a space of desperation and instead writing it as a way for someone to actively be part of the project is almost always more likely to have someone actually come in and give 5, 10, 50, you name it. Um, I always say use images in between paragraphs. It gives you color and context on your page. The number of times I've seen, again, seen people write their campaigns like a grant application, it's boring. Use exclamation marks, show past images of your work, show every single image of a reward because you love that t-shirt that you designed. That's gonna get people excited, right? Also, I love to say, answer the hard questions, don't shy away from things you don't know, and own when you don't know something. So, why are you using Kickstarter in the first place? That might be something that is as simple as, I got a matching grant for $6,000, and I don't have $6,000, so I'm coming to my community and new people who, who have not seen my work yet, and I'm trying to raise 6K so that I can actually get 12, right? It might also be, um, I have an exhibition space, but I need to ensure that I'm paying for my time and paying for my materials. And with your help, I can ensure that that gets, that, I, that like my time is worth getting paid, right? Um, where the funds go, it's actually what I was just saying. We just rolled out a really nice budget feature, actually. It's like a really cute pie chart that you fill in. Uh, what are the materials? Do you need shipping? Artist fee is built in that. Um, our 5% fee is built into it so that you can also understand from, for, for yourself how much is that if you're raising 10K, what's that going to? Again, that is also a way for a reader to see that they can trust you and that you know what you're doing with, with their money, right? Last thing, are there risks to the project? That's actually a mandatory question on Kickstarter. We love for people to do that exercise of what are the actual risks and challenges? If you're doing an exhibition but you don't know where it is, that is a risk. It might say, you know, if I actually don't end up getting a space for this, I'm going to clearly tell you what, what is going on. I'm going to say we're actually going to, we're going to rethink the exhibition and it's going to be in two different locations and my friends' homes and it's going to be more about a community conversation. And I would love for you to join me here are the dates, right? Um, those are a great way to essentially allow a reader to know that you're already thinking about things that may go wrong and you're preemptively thinking about solutions. Does that make sense? Cool. Video, if you choose to do one, I, I mean, honestly, when people go to the page, about half of them don't watch the video. They just read the whole text, they pick a reward and they're done in like two minutes. If they do watch the video, most of the time they only watch it for 30 seconds. <laughs> And then they read two paragraphs of text, they pick the board, and they're done. Um, the internet's attention span is very, very short. Um, again, it's thinking a way of presenting this as a grant or, or presenting this as an exhibition material or proposal. It, short and sweet. So the ask, very similar to the text, get that ask in the first 20 seconds. So if someone is coming to the page and has no idea what Kickstarter is and they watch the video, they know what they're doing. They know that you're fundraising for something, and with their help, they can actually make that thing happen, right? Um, don't be afraid to repeat things from your text. If you've never been on video before, if you've never videoed yourself, use the text you drafted, maybe cut it in half, and see if that makes sense as a script. Pretty easy. Um, great lighting and great sound always help. I've seen amazing videos done on iPhones. And that is as simple as asking a friend who has like an iPhone 7 or better and saying, can I use your phone for a day and shoot my Kickstarter video? And you get a friend's really good microphone and make sure it's a well-lit space. Good. Rewards. I say don't have more than like 10. 
because too many options gets people a little bit confused. I always say start with maybe a $10 thank you and a really nice $25 reward. That could be a postcard, it could be an invitation to an opening, but again, getting a piece of the project or being invited into the project is a great thing to offer at that because most people are gonna come in at 25. The average is about 75 bucks because we're in the art world and there's almost always a heavy hitter that comes in, an angel donor, right, who gives a three or four digit number. Um, so if you're worried about the goal size, divide it by 25, divide it by 75, that's probably how many people you will need in the first place, right? Um, offering different types is uh, something I really love. So of course, getting a thing, like if you're doing a photo book, the photo book should be, the, should be one of the rewards, but also things like experiences potlucks, conversations, uh, acknowledgements such as uh, name in the book, name in the exhibition, sponsor a conversation, sponsor a talk, sponsor a day. These are all ways that you can think about inviting someone in without actually having to do a lot of work and making sure that those production costs are really low because if you're doing a series of tote bags, that's costing you money. But instead, if you reframe it as sponsoring a day or sponsoring a week, if you're uh, supporting a space or a studio, all that takes is inviting that person in and saying, thank you so much for being part of it, right? And spending time with them. Because most of the time, people just want to spend time with you and they want to see the thing happen. Make sense? So outreach, this is our last little slide and then we'll head to questions. Um, this is what you see when you launch a project. This is Ebony's campaign, the uh, pool that she painted. Um, what you'll get is like a timeline as to when you reach your goal. You'll also get a, a dividing line as to how much, uh, uh, how much money is coming in from Kickstarter. So that would be if we put it in a newsletter or they found it with our advanced search or they found it on the homepage. Um, and then how much money you are bringing in from your community. That is oftentimes Emails, which is usually said in direct traffic or no refer information. The majority of people come in because you wrote them an email, actually. I've also seen success if you send people a text. And if you spend 30 minutes texting a friend and saying, hey, I just launched this, can you give it five bucks? Or, hey, I launched this and I know you've always wanted a print. There's a print for 100 that I think you would like. That takes you like 30 seconds. And it ends up being relatively successful because that direct one-on-one -on -one communication is oftentimes more important than social media or sometimes more important than press because those tools tend to garner interest and they garner likes and they garner shares, but it's hard to convert that into an actual pledge. Um, so that's why I always say when you're thinking about this outreach plan, prioritizing those one-to-one -one communication methods like talking to uh, your best friend at the grocery store, talking to someone at an opening, sending someone a text, calling someone, is not only a way to actually like physically be present with them, but it's a way for them to feel like you are inviting them into the project. Um, over and over again, those are the methods of communication that I see be more effective. Do you have questions on outreach? Or do we have general questions? We did it. That was so fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Do we have questions on any of these bullets? Text, video, rewards, outreach? Yeah. So the, the two things that I love that you're teasing out here is the quantity. I, I, I come from a public policy background actually and microeconomics I love. Limited quantities and scarcity drives people. <laughs> if you have a reward that's only five, people are more likely to get it, especially if it says one left, that might be that last piece of the puzzle that pushes that person over the edge and says, okay, I'm gonna get it. Um, with rewards, you can always add more quantities and you can always add rewards while the campaign is live. So if you're seeing the $25 reward like no one's getting, then just scrap it and add like a $40 that's something different. It's a great way to kind of gut check while you're doing it and seeing like, that's not working, whatever, or Twitter's doing nothing, so I'm just gonna forget about Twitter and focus on emails. Um, with shipping, it, it, that is actually a dollar amount that you can set the backer to pay for. So okay. if you're doing printing, like say it's a print for $100, um, you would set 
the shipping if they're based in the US, $15 and it's ship flat file or something. So their pledge would actually be $115. It's also good if you've got friends that are uh, not based in America, making that shipping price like higher than maybe you think it is, like to ship to Japan is like sometimes $30. Um, doing a little bit of that legwork to go, I think this might be more than I anticipate, just set those ones higher. Mm -hmm. you, you can't change a reward if someone's already picked it because that would be like, uh, they got a tote bag and a t-shirt showed up, right? Uh, sorry, you know. Um, the, is, and that's actually leads me to a great point, which is the things that lock during the campaign. So that's a course of reward if someone, has already, if someone has already gotten it. You can't change that. You can't change the goal size. So if it's 10,000, it's 10,000. And you can't change the duration of time. So you can't add more weeks or like run it out. And, and shorten it. And again, that is like essentially those are things that you're holding yourself and your community accountable to reaching. But again, if, if your goal is 10,000, you reach it in two days, you've got 28 days more to double or triple. So it's, it's, it's two things. It's one that I stated, which is they set their goal way too high. So it's like, and I, I look at every single project that launches in art and photography every single day. And the number of times I've seen someone that it's like, this is a great project, I love this story, but they set their goal at $400,000. They're not making it. They're not making it. The second big reason why people don't reach their goal is they launch it on Kickstarter and then sit back and they're like, great, I did it. Right? And when you go back to this uh, idea of 10 to 30% of the people who are going to back it are people you don't know, that's Kickstarter's audience, but that's only 10 and 30%. So it's about owning that idea that like, I do need to get my community involved, I do need to get my friends in the door for five bucks so that they can then share it with a friend, so that they can share it with a friend. Doing that legwork is oftentimes that linchpin. Of, of going the line between hitting that 20 and then just snowballing into 100, right? The, the credit cards only get charged at the end of the campaign when they've reached their goal above and beyond. So again, it's the idea that we're not, we're not taking anyone's money, no one's credit cards to get charged. It's as if the project never happened because the original idea from Kickstarter was essentially let's put an idea out on the internet and see if people want it. And if people don't, then like, I've got to go back to the drawing board. Like something's missing in it. And that's also what I always say of a, a, a project that didn't reach its goal did not fail. You just have to think a little bit differently. Or maybe it's a project for a grant. Maybe it's a project for a residency. So the fun thing is it doesn't really matter. What we tend to see is people who are funding projects in the arts broadly, which is film, music, publishing, they like navigate between all of the categories. Um, sometimes if you are a project that is working in film, performance, and art, I say flip the categories. You, again, that's something you can change. Every five days, change the category and see if n new people pick up and are interested. So it's sometimes actually nice if you've got a project that is touching multiple categories because it's touching multiple communities. It's, in, it's, it's saying this community matters and this community would be interested and this community would be interested. Yeah, so we just announced it actually last week. Um, <laughs> applications are due, oh God, don't quote me on this, March. Um, we do two residencies every year, a spring and a fall. And the Goal is, is to invite five or ten different creative people making something and they need a space to do it. Sometimes that is like, I need to run a Kickstarter for a performance and I have like no theater to work with. That is a pitch that if it's part of the residency, maybe that performance happens at Kickstarter's theater. Um, we have a, our, our building is in Greenpoint. We've got a theater, we have like a podcast recording studio, we have this like garden on the roof. Um, but sometimes it's like uh, someone working in food and they need access to a kitchen, right? Or I had a project, uh, Jen and Kevin McCoy were filmmakers and they needed to film one of the scenes at Kickstarter. 
Um, one of their rewards for 25 bucks was a walk-on roll. <laughs> I was in it. Um, so basically they got their friends to give them 25 bucks and then they showed up one Saturday at Kickstarter and filmed a party scene that was then part of the film and then showed at Postmasters. So the residency is actually great. It's, it's really good if you're thinking about a project whether or not you want to use Kickstarter for it, but you're thinking about a project and you need space for it. You just get to know me. Oh, great. <laughs> um, so if you want my email, it's dsharp at kickstarter.com. Yeah, write that down. That, that is literally like my job. My job is, uh, uh, you can reach me on those, or it's dsharp at kickstarter.com. But my day-to-day -day is doing talks and works like this, and then is having phone calls and meetings with artists that are thinking about a project. Yeah, it, that, it's a great question because the majority of the time, if you are trying to fundraise more than, I would say the rule of thumb is like 15,000, you will, you, the Kickstarter is playing a piece of the funding pie. It is basically, uh, the, maybe the first 10,000 or it's the first 20,000 or it's the last, but the Kickstarter is also functioning as like the press release and it's functioning as a way to get new people excited or it's if you're doing a print series or photo book that's like essentially pre-selling the book, uh, right? So in many ways, it's sometimes if your budget is higher, it's always going to play a piece. You can always try to fundraise for the whole amount, but the Kickstarter becomes like a bit of a marathon and you're just like running to a huge goal. Um, I think oftentimes the more successful and exciting projects that make artists feel comfortable are when they like hit their goal and double it and triple it because that makes them feel like, yeah, this actually was successful. And, and I knew I wanted 20,000, but I set it at 12 and a half and then I raised 19. I've had projects fail and then they relaunch the next day because their goal size was too high. Or I, I like told them two or three times, I think that 25 is really high for the project that you're working on and knowing your community, that might be really difficult. And then they run a project for 30 days and they raise 10 and then they can't make it to the 25. They're like, shoot. And that's when I say it's okay again, if it, the Kickstarter didn't fail, it, no one's credit cards got charged, it's fine. Just relaunch it and set a lower goal. Um, the majority of the time, if those people who backed it the first time and saw it fail, you post an update and say, hey, I was too ambitious in this. I'm lowering my goal and I'm launching again on Tuesday. I'd love for you to join me. Like 90 or 95% of them come and back again. So it's not like a huge drop off too and you don't have to redo that work again. Ebony G. Patterson's project was part of Open Spaces, which was a new triennial in Kansas City, Missouri. They gave her a budget, but it wasn't enough. And she wrote that in her text. She said, Open, Open Spaces get, started me with 20,000, but I know if I really want to do this right, and if I really want to honor this history and make sure the park can continue this legacy, I need 15,000 more. It's almost like those different pieces of the pie are operating as separate entities. Um, I've also seen it the reverse way. Um, like Jackie Summel is an artist based in New Orleans and raised about $30,000 for a project she was working on and then applied to Creative Capital and then got a Creative Capital grant. And then she was like, oh, now I can triple the size of this. So it's sometimes, again, it's thinking through those puzzle pieces, honestly, and going, what timeline do I want to do them on? because it's really up to you. I say like no discount, honestly. So, and I said, and sometimes even a higher, higher price because the majority of the time, again, 10 to 30% of the people coming in don't know you. So that means 70 or 90% know you and know that you might be doing this on your own or might know that this is the first time you're publishing and they will be okay spending $5 more on the book. Um, so it, it, sometimes it's thinking a little bit more generously with yourself. Okay. So basically what happens is, remember this page, the outreach page? 
you scroll down, you see refers, and then when you scroll down, you'll see every single person who's backed at what amount, if they've adjusted their level and went up. Um, so you get that live feed of people coming in. Um, when the campaign closes, you also send what's called surveys, which is essentially saying, thank you so much, now I need your address so I can ship the thing. And do, do you wanna be part of my newsletter? If so, what's your email? Or do you have a friend that might be interested? If so, let me know. Um, the survey is also a way to essentially collect that data, but we don't collect a lot of that at the front, like an address, primarily because uh, we're just like crazy about data. We just do not want, ex we don't want your community's data. <laughs> so it's, it's up to you, yeah, 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 yeah. We get their email addresses to make sure they don't like ghost on a project, right? Um, or if their credit card was put in wrong, we've got to email them and say your credit card was put in wrong. Um, but you get to collect as much as you want and then you take that. It's all because of the PBC. That public benefit corporation is the reason why we really do that stuff. Like we're not a company that wants to just harvest data. We just started a, a way in which um, people who are backing projects in art, we just started now collecting that data and saying, okay, if you were interested in this one art project, Here's four more that we think are really cool because then we want to start incentivizing, you know, common sense patron pledging. But like, that's it. <laughs> oh, great question. Um, tax season. Um, so, a few things. One, Kickstarter can't technically give legal advice because we're not like a law firm. So what we have on the site, if you just go on Google and say Kickstarter taxes, <laughs> you can, uh, it lists out generally what we do, our practices. Most of the time, like we don't issue a 1095, I think that's what it is. 1099, yeah, four numbers off. But uh, we don't issue it if you've gotten under 200 backers or have made less than 20K, because otherwise we would be issuing thousands of them. Um, but then we also say, if it, 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 here's a list of uh, states and countries, click on those and we, re, we redirect you to how to correctly file those. But again, it's making sure that, that, that you're, you have access to the right place to get the right information.